Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Nancy Postero from Anthropology, and I am the director of UCSD's new International Institute, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you all to our new, this is our inaugural event, so here's to the new International for a few minutes about the Institute and then introduce our speaker. The goal of the Institute is to create a collaborative intellectual community of scholars from different disciplines and methodologies to think together about pressing international issues. UCSD, as we all know, has amazing people doing amazing work, but we rarely talk across our disciplinary or divisional lines. So our goal is to bring together social scientists and humanists who produce slow and deep knowledge based on particular case studies, together with those who look at global issues and use big data. We want people who work in labs and clinicians in med schools to work with philosophers and lawyers and anthropologists. So we're beginning this process through funding faculty groups and collaboratories, groups of five faculty members from at least two divisions who will work together over the next year. And these groups can be focused on a regional area, say the Middle East, or a theme, say claiming the city. If you haven't already received the call, there are flyers about it at the, at the table, and you can also go on our new website, internationalinstitute at ucsd.edu. Please consider forming or joining a group, uh, a faculty group. If you have some ideas or questions, please come and talk to me or any of the members of our, our steering committee who are sitting in the front row here, and we will be glad to talk to you about it. I'm actually in the very happy position of being a matchmaker right now for all kinds of people who are coming together and saying, oh, I'm interested in working on that, but who else is there that's working on it? So consider me your matchmaker, and I'll put you in a faculty group or help you form one if you're interested in, in it. And I think that's really going to be one of the main roles that the International Institute gets to play, is, and that is to serve as a node of, of connection between all of us here who work on international issues. The establishment of the International Institute is a product of many years of effort by a dedicated group of faculty here at UCSD. So here I want to ask my interim steering committee to stand up and be recognized. I know you didn't want to really do this, but uh, <laughs> here's our, our group. their names. Um, not everybody's here. Prashant Bharadwaj from Econ, Maureen Feely from Poli Sci, Michael Provence from History, Pamela Radcliffe from History, Akosh Ronatosh from Sociology, Sharon Rose from Linguistics, and Gershan Shafir from Sociology. We are grateful for our, our funding from Chancellor Kosla and to the Dean of Social Sciences, Carol Patton, for administering our new institute. So this institute is a bottom-up endeavor. It will become what the participating faculty and graduate students make it. So we ask you to join our groups, come to us with your ideas, and become members of our community. Later this spring, we'll send out an open call for volunteers on our steering committee, and we would really like new blood and new ideas and new people to come join us in this endeavor. And we'll also be sending out a call for graduate student fellowship funding, so stay tuned. We're delighted to open our institute's events with this afternoon's talk by Wendy Brown. How do we understand the turn to the right that we're seeing across the world? How do we understand this complex and confusing moment that we find ourselves in? As we try to make sense of the moment we're living, our scholarship, I think, can help us understand the underlying structures that get obscured by the debates that are raging around us. We began that earlier today with a panel put on by the Institute for Arts and Humanities on the lessons of totalitarianism in Eastern Europe for the postmodern world. I'm grateful to the Institute and its director, Luis Alvarez, who's here with us, and to their staff person, Joel Fusado, for all the collaboration linking our two events. And now Wendy Brown will talk about authoritarianism in the contemporary moment. So let me take a minute to introduce Wendy. She asked me to make it brief and let the talk speak for itself, but I want to give you a very brief overview of her work. Uh, professor Brown is the class of 1936 first professor of political science at UC Berkeley. She received her PhD in political philosophy from Princeton University in 1983. She lectures around the world and held, has held a number of distinguished visiting fellowships and lectureships. In her many important works, including several, seven single authored books and three edited volumes along with numerous articles, 
She's established new paradigms in critical legal studies and feminist theory. Intertwining the insights of Marx, Nietzsche, Weber, Freud, the Frankfurt School theorists, Foucault, and contemporary continental philosophers, she critically interrogates formations of power, citizenship, and political subjectivity. In, in contemporary, uh, excuse me, in contemporary uh, liberal democracies, she's focused on the, quote, waning sovereignty of states under new global conditions of power, showing how the erosion of nation states under new global conditions of power uh, excuse me, I'm getting confused here. Showing how the erosion of nation states has produced anxious efforts to shore up national identity through the building of walls. In addition, she's published on secularism, emphasizing how the meaning of critique in modern liberalism is bound up with the question of managing religious affiliation so that religion has always served as a presupposition for modern secular statehood. I have been particularly influenced by her work on neoliberalism, governmentality, and sovereignty. She's developed an important critical theory of neoliberal rationality, extending Foucault's thinking on the subject by considering its effect on higher education, law, and governance. Her most recent book, Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution, describes in details the way neoliberalism works how market logics have permeated our societies, and how it undermines, undermines the basic principles of liberal democratic institutions. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's a brilliant and terrifying book. In the epilogue, written long before our recent election, she suggests a possible overlap between neoliberalism and fascism. So when we planned our inaugural event on authoritarianism, I asked her to share her thoughts with us today about that topic. Wendy, we're so pleased to have you with us. So please join me in welcoming Wendy Brown. Thank you, Nancy. It's a, a great pleasure to be here with um, old friends and new. Um, and uh, I feel very grateful to Southwest. Uh, I think it'll be with us after the revolution. It's the airline that makes it possible for us to see one another amidst busy teaching schedules and to share thinking, and as you put it, to do some deep and slow thinking. My admiration for the Institute, as you just described it, is enormous. It's exactly what we need right now. Um, and so I'm also honored to be part of your beginnings here. I, I fear I will fail in one respect, which is that only toward the very end do I move outside of the US uh, to, to reflect on our current conjuncture, as Stuart Hall would put it. Um, but I think that oddly, sadly, uh, the, the November election results have made so many people who used to be more globally oriented suddenly very America-centric. Um, I myself have tried to deal with that by committing to follow at least two stories outside the US every week, like whether it's the Dutch elections or the French, or whether it's what's going on in Chile or South Africa. Uh, I think it's, it's hard work because we, it's not navel gazing, but um, fear and panic has made us dwell within. So it won't be terribly international in scope, but it will deal with something that I gave you as a title. What I am going to offer is a, a very partial and uh, early effort to try to critically theorize an aspect of our conjuncture. Let me just let the folks who are coming in have a seat. Don't, you don't have to stand. <laughs> You're not faulted for wandering. <laughs> um, so this is not meant to be a total picture. Uh, and in particular, there's some things I'm going to be bracketing as I focus today. I'm going to bracket the chaos and calamity and immediate dangers of the new regime vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world and even particularly vulnerable populations. Because my focus will be on the formations and the currents within the United States and more generally under neoliberal regimes that have brought us to this pass. So just to continue with the bracketing for a second, um, I think what's happening in the upper echelons of American political life, especially on the right, uh, is, is somewhat different from what's been mobilized from below. So I'm not going to be focusing on those upper echelons, even though I think trying to figure out, trying to map what's going on between the GOP establishment neoliberals, neoconservatives, paleoconservatives, evangelicals, the alt-right, Bannon, Lyndon Company, all of those 
uh, conjunctures and fissures and oppositions and, and, and new friends are important to understand, to, to try to figure out where the vulnerabilities are at the top level. But I'm going to be thinking more about um, developments among the citizens and subjects who brought us to this pass. Why? Because as long as we have the shell of electoral democracy, and I've found myself, as many have, I think, newly attached and appalled by that shell, um, but newly attached because my biggest fear is that we might not see elections in two or four years if the terror attacks that are on the horizon bring us uh, the kind of policing and national emergency that might unfold. But as long as we have the shell of electoral democracy, I think it's really important to figure out how approximately 25% of the American citizenry were brought to Trumpism. How does the patent plutocracy of this regime, the hundreds of billions in wealth, represented by the small combination of Trump, his cabinet, and his closest supporters and advisors, how does that patent plutocracy come to rest on a base that stands to gain materially very little and stands to lose an enormous amount? How has that base been mobilized by its whiteness and more precisely by its white woundedness? And how does it find itself mirrored in Trump's own aggrieved white persona and positions? So that's where I want to focus for this hour. And I'll do it by repeating things that many of us know, but try to gather them into something like an analysis. So many have noted, all Trump voters did not, do not line up with everything he calls for and is any more than all Clinton voters this one, for example, lined up with her corporate cronyism, neoliberalism, militarism, and political opportunism. Some Trump voters were mad about the cost of their health care, their lost jobs, their declining standards of living and communities. Some were ultra-Zionists. Some longed for a time before the challenges of globalization and climate change and basked in or clung to his promise to simply vanquish both with words. Some hoped that a Trump presidency would better their prospects as business owners, or as investors, or as workers. And here it's really important to remember that tax cuts have been at the top of the GOP agenda for 35 years. And during the campaign, though it's hard to remember this, Trump spoke about cutting taxes at least twice as often as he spoke about bombing ISIS or building a wall. Some evangelicals and Catholics voted only on abortion while objecting to much else. Some voted for the Republican on the ticket because they always have. Some recoiled from Hillary and were fortified in her monstrification by Fox News, by Breitbart, by social media. Some alt-writers and Klansmen and Nazis and others voted for the first time in their lives, not because Trump was exactly their man, but because he threw them more bait than any viable candidate had since George Wallace. And some, of course, already politically fearful, were recruited by Trump's fear-mongering. Here, I just want us to pause and remember that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were two of the most disliked candidates in the history of American presidential campaigns. And even the 50% of eligible voters who made it to the polls did a lot of nose-holding, and that's why Trump entered the White House with the lowest approval ratings in history. Okay, all this said, who voted for Trump. And here I'm going to repeat the familiars. 88% of his support was white. He garnered two thirds of white voters without a college degree, over half of white female voters, two thirds of white male voters, and almost three quarters of white voters over the age of 50. He did garner more Latino votes, about 25%, and more votes from the well-off and college-educated than was expected. Surprisingly, among college-educated whites, only 39% of men and 51% of women voted for Hillary Clinton. But Tr Trump's mass support came from working and lower middle class, 35-year and older, uneducated whites, especially white men. This is and remains his base. This is that stubborn 38 to 40 percent of Americans who continue to approve of his presidential performance, no matter what he does. Moreover, of Trump voters, 
nearly 25% interviewed in exit polls said that they did not think he was qualified for the presidency and that Hillary Clinton was. What these figures tell us is that we are not dealing mainly with the politically abandoned working and lower middle class, but with dethroned whites, especially white men, who may or may not have lost earning power, but have lost social power and pride of place in the conjuncture of four historical developments. First, Four decades of neoliberal policies and practices that have gutted wages, benefits, pensions, job security, infrastructure, and access to higher education, hence access to social mobility among the working and lower middle classes. Second, not quite the same as the first, but often presumed to be, three decades of financialization the shift of our economic engine to financial markets that has dramatically exacerbated the redistribution upward of wealth, including through the real estate driven financial crisis that took heavy casualties in the group that supported Trump through foreclosures, through savings meltdowns, and in some cases, simply through home devaluations. The third historical conjuncture that we need to pay close attention to is globalization which has transformed both the economies and the populations, the demographics of the global north, draining them on the one hand of large scale manufacturing and other kinds of uh, productive sites in the economy, but also draining them of whiteness. And the fourth historical trajectory that we really need to attend to but understand in a precise way is a perceived liberal political agenda promoting the historically excluded women, racial and sexual minorities, the disabled, new immigrants, and above all, blacks. By perceived, I mean that this is the way that many Trump voters interviewed argue that this liberal political agenda has gone. What I mean is that two thirds of Trump supporters believe, and I'm quoting, whites are not getting what they deserve today, while, quote, blacks are getting more than they deserve. And when interviewed, they say blacks have been specifically favored by affirmative action and welfare, despite the fact that both have been systematically dismantled over the past three decades. In fact, African Americans as a population, both urban and rural, have suffered far greater declines than whites in, past, in the past 30 years. Unemployment rates and housing costs, the decline of union jobs, diminished public services and educational funding, all of these combine to lower the standard of living overall for African Americans more than for whites. But that decline constitutes a broken promise. It's not the stuff of raging resentment at lost entitlement and lost pride of place. Now, did all of these white people who voted for Trump actually blame minorities and immigrants for their own felt deprivations or those they identified with the nation. No, but obviously the Trump campaign facilitated that easy displacement, taking a page from Nietzsche on ressentiment, Freud on narcissistic wounds, where one seeks an object, any object, on which to displace one's humiliation, one's suffering, or one's felt weakness. But even here, I want us to consider the heterogeneous character of white Trump support. And I want to suggest, really quite hypothetically, that it has at least three different energies or strands, and, and that we need to consider each of these as we plot strategies that would build alternatives to the present. I'll be developing each of these, but let me list them first. The first is the, the yearning for protection and stability and order motivated by anxiety and fearfulness that responded to Trump the strong man, the wall builder, the decider, the enforcer. These are especially the middle-aged suburbanites and I think might to some degree be recoverable. The second strand or energy is that which we could characterize as the yearning for disruption and revenge, animated much more by humiliation and by rage than by fear. And it responded, of course, to the boorishness, the bravado, the swagger. And these are the thugs, the trolls, the provocateurs that one comes upon, not only in um, right-wing 
websites, but obviously in the comments section of every last article that you mistakenly drop down into the comment section to read <laughs> after you've read the article. These will hang on, I think, the longest. The third strand or energy um, is, uh, could best perhaps be described as those yearning for a fix, that is to fix things, who are more motivated by, by socioeconomic frustration and responded to the promise of tax cuts, of protectionism, of improved health care, of jobs. They're often the ones who are the, the, the most holding their nose about Trump the person. Um, they're classic Republicans and some swing voters. Now, all three of these, alas, converge on the threat of the demonized immigrant, whether Muslim or Mexican. All three reject globalism, inclusiveness, and foreignness. So all three can be rallied by America first sentiments. And that's why, despite the disastrous initial rollout of the immigration ban, by, despite opposition to it from many quarters of government, from the judiciary to the generals, even in the aftermath of that disastrous rollout, it retained the support of nearly half the citizenry. But among these groups, there are also non-convergences, investments in different aspects of the Trump regime, which I'll be exploring shortly. And I also want to suggest that focusing on these three strands reminds us that none of them are necessarily on board for the alt-right's civilizational war, Bannon's apocalyptic fourth turning in history, or full-on fascism. The question I'll be pressing toward the end and invite us to think about is whether they could be recruited into it by right-wing news, by marination in the discourse, by terror attacks, by liberal mockery of them, or by right-wing mockery of liberalism, and by certain seductions of political libidinal freedom. And I'll be speaking about that toward the very end of my talk. All right, I want to go more slowly now through what I'm calling these three energies or strands. I'm not saying they're discrete groups. Sometimes there's overlap in a single human being. And I don't think they exhaust the question of Trump support. But I do think that what I've learned from my perusal of some of the social science literature is they, they get at some of it. OK, I want to start with the first group, which I'll call anxious authoritarians. I've been reading a little of the recent social science on those drawn to authoritarian rule, which has its pluses and minuses as a, as a body of literature. But here's what I want to extract and offer to you. This literature, which mostly works with um, various ways of trying to get at uh, uh, accurate and honest responses to questions that are trying to tap for or test for authoritarian inclinations. This literature tells us that Folks who are drawn to authoritarianism, aren't themselves authoritarians, but are drawn to it, have deeper fears than the rest of the electorate. And they're especially anxious about disorder and change, figured today by feminism, by queers, by multiculturalism. But they're also especially anxious about foreignness and threats, figured by ISIS, by new immigrants, and so forth. So they respond to fear mongering. A depiction of the world as disordered and dangerous, a depiction of drugs and crime and terror pouring through the porous boundaries of their homes or their bodies or their neighborhoods or families or nations or races. This group or anxious authoritarians want the law and order, but also the strength, the decisiveness, the willingness to use force that Trump campaigned on. Politically and socially, the social science tells us, they prize protection and stability achieved through the exercise of power. They do not prize democratic procedure or institutions. Now, the key question for critical theory, which is where I hang in relationship to social science, is whether these so-called authoritarian personalities are hardwired, just waiting to be activated by a threat or by a leader. I think that thesis, that it's hardwired, is contravened by the fact that in 2011, long before Trump, 44% of US non-college graduates, but only 28% of college grads, approved of having, quote, a strong leader 
who doesn't have to bother with Congress or elections. You see the same split on the justifiability of, of abortion and homosexuality. College education literally cuts in half the number of those who reject these practices as upsetting traditional values and order. Or to approach the matter another way, the number of Americans who think it would be a good idea for the army to rule has doubled over the past two decades, from 6% to 12%. And in case that seems like a small percent, just remember only 24% altogether of Americans voted for Trump. All right, so these devotees of authoritarianism, I want to suggest, are made, not born, and our challenge is to understand how they are made. Even the social science admits that, quote, non-authoritarians can be scared into authoritarian conduct and views, and Trump's brilliance was to stoke fear and address the desire for walled security, for eviction of disruption and danger that he alone would and could provide. And that's why, he kept it the dark picture that so many thought was a kind of over-the-top campaign tactic. Okay, so that's the first strand or energy. You want to turn to the second one, which I would call the, the kind of the army of the great fuck you, the apocalyptic populism. I don't care what happens in the world. I just want to express my rage, my rancor, um, my outrage at who you are and what the world is. For the resentful and the humiliated, what I'm going to be calling the socially castrated and enraged, fear and danger are not the animating thing. What they seek, blatantly and frankly, is restored white male entitlement, or at least its political affirmation, even if it can't be materially resurrected. Here, with Make America Great Again barely masked as Make America White Again, white male again, Trump converted social and economic castration into a disinhibited grab for that white male entitlement. A grab by the pussy, by the racial slur, by xenophobia, by generalized denigration of the weak, by affirming the poorly educated, and attacking the cosmopolitan. In all of this, Trump was tonic for their displaced potency and place. Unreconstructed and unapologetic about the power of his own whiteness and wealth and the unbridled rights of his penis. And if not ordinary in his billions, then certainly ordinary in his bluster and his boorishness, his impulsive, opinionated, willfully uninformed and insulting style, his lack of concerns with facts, with changing positions, these qualities constituting, of course, his very lack of qualifications for the presidency, are also what made him every man, not irrelevant, but crucial to his appeal as a populist. His repeated insistence in his inaugural speech that for the first time, the people would be represented in the White House came right at this appeal and identification with him, not because he represented the people in many of his plans, or again, in his plutocratic designs, but in himself. His style also produced, I think, a versatile, far-reaching political personal metaphor, a promise to throw America's weight around as he throws his own, nuking, busting NATO, bringing Mexico and China to heel, bombing ISIS, insulting any and all who disagreed with him. The widely noted danger of such conduct in the presidency is irrelevant to the pumping up and restored potency that it promises. And again, that's why his lack of qualifications didn't matter. With his giant fuck you to liberals, multiculturalists, feminists, intellectual and cultural sophisticates, the so-called urban elite, Trump reasserted the entitlement, politically and personally, to be a bully and a bomb thrower because bullying and bomb throwing is the exclusive right of white maleness on the earth, no matter how little else it has. Of course, no other configuration of human can talk or conduct this way, itself this way, without suffering profiling, censure, ridicule, political self-destruction, criminalization, or incarceration. But in Trump, this very conduct not only re-legitimated swaggering white maleness and Americanness, it also re-sutured them at the level of identity. 
where the castration of that white maleness was linked to the castration of the nation, and where the greatness of, of, of America would be relinked to the greatness, or at least the idea of the supposed greatness, of that white male. Here, I want to suggest that liberal head scratching about how Trump's unchecked impulses could carry the promise of order and protection, the promise that first group needed. This misses the importance of Trump's disinhibition for anointing the wound of castrated white masculinity in the 21st century. And of course, it misses the provocation that Hillary Clinton represented. Well spoken, smart, knowledgeable, tough, ardently if conventionally feminist, circulating in worlds of power and connection, experienced and careful. She's everything they feel demeaned and dethroned by, and is why they hated her so. The third strand or energy, socioeconomic and cultural demotion. OK, how does this go? We've got fear and danger for the authoritarians, bullying, bellicosity, and political incorrectness for the resentful and angry white dudes, and then carnage and decline, hemorrhaged jobs, wrecked cities and towns for that third energy emanating from dethroned whiteness, frustration with decline, deracination, or failed promises. If Clinton ignored that first strain, and if she positively revolted the second one, the third was quite alienated by her basic campaign message. We've made progress, she kept saying. We need to keep on the path. There's more to be done, but we're going in the right direction. America's already great. That message, decoded, was aimed at the professional class, the techies, the young, and those recently socially and politically enfranchised, racial and sexual minorities, the disabled, <laughs> older women, new immigrants felt an actual decline framed Midlands, middle-aged, older, white, working, and lower middle class experience. So all that Clinton's progress and America's already great message did was underscore this population's sense of being dethroned by the new groups and professions, by cosmopolitanism, multiculturalism, and finance that left this group feeling both left behind and like garbage. OK, so we have an unstable, dangerous, punitive know-nothing in the White House because of white people freaking out about security, racial and gender status, and fading opportunity, helped along by right-wing media, and the wrong Democratic candidate for the Times, the consummate candidate of Davos and Washington. But why did this produce anti-democratic, authoritarian populism? Why did it give license to a resurgent plutocracy, a plutocracy that had been rising through the Reagan and Bush years, but was sharply interrupted by Obama? Here, we do need to make a turn to neoliberalism, understood both as policy and rationality. So at the level of policy, we're thinking about neoliberalism in terms of free trade, deregulation, Regressive taxation, replacing progressive taxation, unbridled capital, leashed labor, a stripped out welfare state, and privatized public goods. At the level of rationality, we're thinking in brief that neoliberalism understands or promulgates a form of reason in which every organized human activity is supposed to be submitted to markets, even more, Everything should be submitted to market reason, economized in value and conduct. So here our question is, in what way did the combination of policy and rationality, a global economic order, and a form of social and political reason and governing, in what way did these produce the current regime? Formally, of course, this election represents a rejection of global free trade and privatization by the left and right. Sanders and Trump converged on protectionism. All the candidates talked about governing, government investing in infrastructure. And even Clinton walked back the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. Both left and right were forced by the Sanders campaign to address college unaffordability and student debt in the wake of privatizing higher ed over the past several decades. For this reason, 
Many pundits have declared neoliberalism dead in the aftermath of Brexit and the American election. And yet, obviously, the signature neoliberal policies of privatizing public goods and deregulating everything has been put on steroids in the new order. More importantly, though, Trump's rise from the protectionism to the authoritarianism, from the xenophobia to the NATO knocking, from the permanent campaigning to the reduction of politics to deal making. All of these are nothing but neoliberalism's effects. So I want to walk us through this briefly now. <clears throat> First and most obvious has to do with the declining living standards, the slipping standards of living resulting from stagnating or declining wages, along with decreases in job security, retirement provisions, infrastructure, school quality, and more. All of those things that neoliberal policy generated by unleashing capital, gutting unions, and, and, and uh, divesting from social and public goods. Not to mention neoliberalism's production of an Affordable Health Care Act that was so severely compromised by private interests, those of pharmaceuticals, hospitals, insurance companies, and medical professionals, that it could not deliver access to high quality health care at a reasonable cost. Then, of course, there's neoliberal globalization. What's, what's uh, widely known is that neoliberal trade, labor, tax, and tariff policy eroded nation state sovereignty and eroded the distribution of wealth in the global north. It also produced a global race to the bottom in wages and public revenues. But here's how we need to, I think, put the, put the specific signature of globalization under the Trump campaign. Inchoately, until Trump made it coate, many dethroned American whites imagined a kind of link between the decline of American economic power the decline of white power, the decline of male earning power, and the decline of nation state sovereignty, control, the nation's control of its own fate, its own borders, its own identity. And of course, they're right. From offshore union factory jobs, to disappearing affordable housing, to the unprecedented flows of migration and finance and capital, the era of the protected, stable white male provider the era of secure nation state sovereignty and the era of uncontested American economic supremacy, these are all finished. They cannot be reversed, but they can be politically instrumentalized. And this is where the figure of the immigrant is obviously so important, where the Arab Muslim fuses with the undocumented Guatemalan or Mexican, where the wall merges with the travel ban, where the false promise of good jobs mixes with the false promise of protection from crime and terror. This is where eroded borders and boundaries, eroded economic power, and eroded security are all braided together in a racialized causal logic and braided together in an economic redress. Good deals will replace bad ones. And therefore require a seasoned, powerful businessman to take charge. This is where the implicit promise to whites to make America great again elides into the America first trope that legitimates self-interest at every turn. And delegitimates what? Delegitimates policy oriented by justice, by public interest, by humanitarianism. They're delegitimated as giveaways, bad deals, compromising and selling out the nation, as whites themselves have been compromised and sold out, as their entitlements and just desserts have been given away to others here and around the world through those bad deals. In short, if the policy term is away from free trade, the reasoning that, that Trump himself uh, promulgated, if you can associate him with reasoning, remains neoliberal. And we need to dive a little bit deeper into this at this point. In addition to its governing rationality of economization, that is casting every activity and sphere in an economic frame, casting markets and market conduct as appropriate for all human endeavor and organization, neoliberal reason involves a sometimes tacit, sometimes explicit rejection of politics and democracy, <coughs> soliciting in their place a statism 
based on technocracy, on business conduct, and the promulgation of markets. Now, the point I'm pushing here is not the familiar one about neoliberal governmentality, that market justice comes to replace social and political justice. That's true. That's one of the things neoliberal reason brings about. But the point I want to make here is that markets and their needs in neoliberal reason become the only legitimate basis of state policy, while politics, whether partisan or interested or majoritarian, constitutes an illegitimate, counterproductive interference in market worlds. That is, in addition to politics, neoliberal reason also casts democracy itself as interfering where markets should decide. And you see this explicitly in the work of Hayek and the Ordo liberals. Put another way, the neoliberal principle of deregulation is not just an economic principle, it's an ontological one meant to extend everywhere and to everything. This is why the Roberts Court, dominated since the 1990s by neoliberalism, not merely by a conservative majority, but a majority that itself was steeped in uh, the law and economics school, the Roberts Court has employed deregulation across an incredibly diverse range of cases, from dismantling campaign finance restrictions to dismantling affirmative action to eliminating restrictions on corporate advertising and eliminating class action suits against corporations instead forcing binding arbitration. It's why the First Amendment has become the political weapon of the right a means to deregulate everything and promote markets everywhere, to let everything be decided by markets, and to let everything be determined by individual and corporate rights within those markets. So the double move of the Roberts Court is on the one hand deregulation and the other to include corporations as persons with rights who have the same powers as individuals. The, the First Amendment has become the political weapon of the right to deregulate everything rather than to have democratic determination about what is just or what is good, whether in health care or in education or anywhere else, determine policy. Okay, the point. Neoliberalism explicitly challenges both politics and democratic will. It aims to overcome both with markets. It aims to treat both as interfering in the freedom, the spontaneity, the efficiency of markets. But equally important, of course, is that neoliberal reason, with its economization of everything, erodes democratic values, institutions, and expectations. And this aspect of, of the neoliberal uh, destruction of democracy is really key to generating mass support for authoritarian government dressed in business garb. As neoliberal reason elevates market values to governing values, the basic terms of democracy lose their meaning and status. Equality and liberty become reduced to the equal right to compete in a world of markets which generates winners and losers. Popular sovereignty, when it's economized, becomes literally incoherent. It has no place in markets. Individual consumer sovereignty rather than popular sovereignty is what governs. And then, of course, neoliberalism weakens democratic culture by privatizing every kind of public good and introducing business governance practices into every public institution. At the same time, it reduces citizenship to consumer status in what the Roberts Court routinely called the political marketplace whenever it wrote about democracy over the last 10 years. Now taken together, the open neoliberal disparagement of politics as such and the more subtle neoliberal erosion and corrosion of democratic values, practices, and imaginaries, together these produce a fertile breeding ground for an anti-democratic, anti-egalitarian, and anti-proceduralist populism, a populism that burns on the fuel of fear and anxiety, sliding status, and wounded whiteness. Again, here it's really important to remember Trump's not just any authoritarian, he's a businessman. He's not just any businessman, but a real estate magnate who reduces governing to deal-making and even swindling where possible.
That's the legit practice in his world. Trump's consistent characterization of his predecessors is that they made bad deals, and he'll make good ones, with China, Russia, Europe, the UN, Ford, Fiat, coal, and those states that supported him, but not the ones that didn't. His promise to drain the swamp was a promise to get politics out of politics, not Wall Street. Just as he dismisses as politics judicial and congressional resistance to his executive orders, his cabinet appointees, protests against him, or press revelations about him. In all of this, what's he drawing on? The neoliberal common sense that politics in general, and democracy in particular, are the worst form of interference with business conduct aimed at securing competitive advantage. This common sense also permits his regime to press forward with two vital neoliberal precepts, deregulation, as it takes aim at laws protecting against climate change, environmental spoilage, labor exploitation, the unbridled power of finance. So deregulation is one vital neoliberal precept that, of course, as I said earlier, has been put on steroids, and privatization, as the Trump regime strikes at the NEA, the NEH, the NIH, public media, and public education. Now here, I want to underscore that neoliberalism has never rejected statism. It rejects government usurpation of or interference in markets, but not the statist propping of markets or policy concerned with security or other dimensions of existence. And Trump's own anti-politics is not anti-state. It moves against law and proceduralism as it affirms not the strategic innovation and disruption of the tech economy, but the thuggish, opportunistic, sue me and I'll sue you world of New York City real estate development. It also prizes loyalty, personal relationships, and results over accountability and representation. The aim is to get things done, get ahead of the competition. And that's partly, again, why the original rollout of the Muslim ban happened as it did and produced neither apology nor remorse, only anger at the politics that defeated it. It's why misstatements and missteps are so quickly swept away as reputational damage that can be fixed with reputational repair common to business. But it's also why the presidency continues as a campaign, a relentless advertisement. So politics is bad deals, carnage, all talk, or interests, partisanship, corruption. And what's needed instead is a tough CEO who can make good deals because he can both build and bomb relationships as needed. What's in the way of this is democratic institutions, laws, courts, procedures, bureaucracy, the press, and more. This is, in short, neoliberal reason voiced directly by the state. But if neoliberalism casts politics as interference in what should be ordered by market rationality, by market conduct and market values, populist authoritarianism, bathed in neoliberal rationality, takes this up a notch. Politics now, rather than simply interference, which is how the neoliberals cast it, becomes disloyalty, ordering on treason, because we've already presented the state as being in a time in an era of danger where it has to protect itself from all of its enemies, all of the outsiders and uh, internal dissenters who would undo it. So rather than mere interference, politics now also becomes disloyalty, ordering on treason, which is how he casts the deep state, the press, and other detractors. It's why judges, he said, would have blood on their hands in the next terror attack for preventing his first Muslim ban. It's how the protesting people become the enemies of the state that has the real people at its heart. This is classic populist authoritarianism. However compromised by his narcissism and his buffoonery, Trump takes his mandate to be cleaning up the mess made of the nation by political interests, politicians, and democracy. And what's in his way? What's in his way is what every business needs to dodge or dismantle. Regulations, procedures, checks and balances, internal opposition, leaking, protests, bad press. All of which, of course, 
he is determined to dismantle, to end run, to silence, or to lock out. This is how I'm suggesting a neoliberal populist revolt became dem anti-democratic authoritarianism. But was it all along? If neoliberalism generated conditions for the rejection of democratic institutions, values, and practices, if it did this by decimating livelihoods and neighborhoods, by delegitimizing and corroding democracy, by eroding national sovereignty, by devaluing knowledge apart from business expertise, by governing according to best practices borrowed from business. I am not suggesting that this means that the political formation taking shape today was ever intended by neoliberal intellectuals or policymakers. To the contrary, the nationalism, the protection, but above all, the fusion of corporate, financial, and government power, the mobilization of hate groups, all of these things comprising the specter of fascism today, these are nightmares for classical neoliberals and neoliberalism. Corporocracy, plutocracy, fascism, this is what the neoliberals from Freiburg to Vienna to Chicago were arrayed against. They opposed these things as strongly as they opposed socialism, and they believed that the welfare state and social planning were what generated both, both corporocracy and plutocracy and fascism and socialism. Conversely, the original neoliberals believed that markets propped by carefully formatted state policy was the antidote to both. They dreaded corporate power in office, in political office. They dreaded protectionism and other ways of rigging markets. And above all, they dreaded the lashing together of economic, political, and social power. There were lots of differences between the original neoliberals, as many of you know, those from Vienna, from Germany, from Chicago. But what binds them, what allows us to speak of them as neoliberals, is their commitment to a modified economic and political liberalism in which they all had both a deep emphasis on economic liberty and a commitment to the separation of economic and political power. They were as nervous about rent-seeking plutocrats as they were about Keynesian technocrats. What they also dreaded, especially Hayek and the order liberals, and what they drafted neoliberalism to counter was political life influenced by the deluded, myth-mongering, their word, manipulable masses the very theater in which Trump is now playing. And again, they believed this could be prevented by promulgating markets through governmentality rooted in economic principles and supported by a technocratic state. So to argue that neoliberalism tilled the soil for anti-democratic authoritarian populism doesn't mean that it's the telos of neoliberalism, that neoliberalism was fascist all along. Rather, I'm suggesting it's neoliberalism's Frankenstein. On the one hand, neoliberalism generated the socioeconomic frustrations, the instabilities, the precarities, the loss of national horizons, the social disintegration that foment the nationalism, the racism, the demand for authoritarian rule. On the other hand, neoliberalism generated the hostility toward politics and the profound devaluation of democracy in favor of market justice, market rationales, and market governance. On a third hand, neoliberalism generated a plutocratic class from deregulated markets. And this is where Thomas Piketty's work is so important. He reminds us that contrary to what the neoliberals thought, free markets actually generate higher aggregations of capital accumulation and thus a concentration of capital, accumula capital accumulation at the top, then, then it does growth. Or let me put that a little more coherently. It's late in the day. Um, capital ac accumulation outruns growth, so it tends to, uh, tends to concentrate on the top, and slow growth ends up producing rent-seeking from those at the top from the fire sector, from the finance, insurance, and real estate sector, exactly the sector populating Trump's cabinet. Hence, this group increasingly becomes invested in controlling government power, exactly the nightmare 
that the neoliberals were trying to prevent, but which their belief in free markets actually ended up inadvertently producing. So my point, just as Weimar's unpredictable fruit was fascism, the neoliberal revolution, too, has an unintended but retrospectively predictable spawn. To conclude, let me step back a little bit from the US predicament for these reflections. Obviously, there is a ferocious eruption today of right-wing, xenophobic, nationalist populism throughout the Euro-Atlantic and even beyond. There is, we could say, in common in what's happening in this surge of white nationalism and xenophobic populism, a reaction against the declining power and significance of the nation state as an economic container, but also as a cultural container, as a site of homogeneous identity. There is, we could say, a furious death rattle of white male rule and entitlement, cultural, social, economic, and political. There is a populist roar against the destruction of itself as a demos and the destruction of its political institutions as in any way representative or even functional. There is a widespread fear of terror, precarity, and volatility in a world increasingly dominated by finance, rocked by violence, but controlled by no one. And then, of course, there's the dispersion of news and analysis through a highly sectoralized media and internet sites, which generates a loss of veracity, reliability, common facts and narratives, and, and thus us any kind of common publics. And then there's exploitation of all of these factors by politically ambitious and economically powerful forces who keep the uh, unrest or the rebellion from turning either anti-capitalist or radically democratic. Now this leaves us with a nest of questions. What is the danger today of preserving the shell of electoral democracy when almost everything that makes popular rule viable has actually been cleaned out of that shell? What possibilities are there for right and left populist energies to be rerouted for democratic energies? What possibilities are there to convert authoritarian or nihilistic or apocalyptic populism into aspirations for new democratic forms or jurisdictions and economic arrangements? If there are such possibilities, I don't think they rest in the domain of jettisoning identity politics and globalism for national class politics. That's the self-serving nonsense, I think, of Lilla and Brooks. It all started, actually, with Richard Rorty. Um, I've tried to make clear that lefties speaking to class pain isn't going to bring tens of millions of white voters back to democratic, egalitarian, inclusive, multicultural values in Europe or in the US. Just as discovering that Trump can't build a wall, can't deport 12 million people, can't restore American manufacturing, eliminate feminism and same-sex marriage, conquer ISIS, bring China to heel, secure affordable health care, and rebuild the middle class while slashing taxes, will convert Trump supporters to Elizabeth Warren or Perez or Ellison. Rather, the question here is how, if they can be reached, they can't, how, whether these folks can be reached, and if so, how. Can they be turned back from the fascist road toward which they're being pointed? I said at the beginning, I don't think they're on it yet. They're being pointed toward it, in which they're being steeped by certain aspects of right-wing news and websites and social media, in which they're being steeped by the normalization of organized hate, most recently embodied, of course, by the GOP's striking refusal to distance itself immediately from the Iowa Center, Senator King's open and ardent white nationalist speech on um, and tweets on the weekend. So do we aim at this project of trying to reach these folks? And if so, how? Do we do organizing and consciousness raising and mobilization among the other side? Or do we prepare for battle, for civil war with them? And what would that look like? Can they be brought back? from a growing fascist formation? Or must we simply overwhelm them demographically by organizing our own side? But even if we succeeded electorally in a couple of years, what is to be done with this social political development? 
What of the worldwide surge of xenophobic nationalisms and apocalyptic populisms? Populisms that I'm calling apocalyptic or nihilistic because they don't really care if the world has a future, because this is the last stand of white male rule, and they are willing to take the world with them as they go down. And what to do with the fact that what the left bids for, what it must bid for, modest egalitarianism, humanitarianism, sustainable futures, protecting the vulnerable, that does entail dethroning white men, as well as living smaller and more equitably. Put another way, climate change and globalization may be inconvenient truths, disruptive and demanding vis-a-vis -vis existing ways of life, but equality, inclusion, living peaceably together in a troubled world, these are very inconvenient principles for the historically dominant. They're economically, socially, and psychically challenging. Hence, our greatest difficulty may be in the brilliant alt-right campaign to associate anti-egalitarian, anti-immigrant, and anti-responsibility sentiments with freedom and fun. The campaign to characterize left and liberal commitments as repressive, regulatory, grim, and policing under the rubric of political correctness. The call here, the call of the alt-right to its would-be converts, is a release from responsibility for the self, for others, for the world, for a social compact with others, for a social compact with the future, in the name of a certain kind of political and social disinhibition, or what my colleague Hans Sluga reminds us Nietzsche called the desublimated will to power of nihilism. That is, what happens when the restraints of moral and ethical values come off and the will to power in a nihilistic worldview because um, ethical and moral values have been so destabilized or recede altogether off the horizon, that will to power comes surging back out. Let me go just a little further here. Trump himself is celebrated by many of his supporters for, quote, saying what he thinks. But so also are the internet trolls and provocateurs, where irreverence, hectoring, defiance of polite society are not just the currency but the prize. And this, of course, is the sport that the infamous Milo Yiannopoulos converted into both a lucrative career for a while and a moniker for the alt-right. What we need to pay attention to here, I think, is how this gleeful mocking of every principle of social justice, equality, and protected vulnerability, the representation of all of us as snowflakes, how this injects white male supremacism with the rocket fuel of freedom fun, debauchery, and even bullying. Releasing that very formation from responsibility for any of the woes of this world, socioeconomic injustice, climate change, wars, you name it. Um, right about the time that Berkeley was about to be visited by Milo Yiannopoulos and a group of faculty um, put forward a petition suggesting that we thought he ought to be disinvited, not on the basis of whether his speech was protected, but on the basis that his speech actually converted into conduct as harassment, because he picks out individuals, projects their images, invites his audience to mock and harass them, and then to do more of that on campus with those same individuals who are on campus. So we made this argument, and it was widely publicized, and the letter ended up in you know, the New York Times and so forth. And of course, what one gets then at that point is all kinds of unsolicited mail from um, all kinds of people in the world, some of it direct hate mail. Um, but one letter I received was from an educated middle-aged white woman who very much objected to our objections to Milo. Um, and she wrote the following in her letter. I introduced my 23-year-old law student daughter here in London to Milo's videos, and she said he makes her feel relieved and natural and free. And for me, he's like a loose, flowery shirt in an all-plaid environment. Now, what I want to suggest <laughs> is that when disinhibition and fun and naturalness and, above all, freedom become the calling card 
of the new authoritarianism. It gains an unprecedented power, a power hinted at by Marcuse with his formulation back in One Dimensional Man of repressive desublimation, releasing energies that are still operating in a repressive regime, but now have been released formally. It also was hinted at by Sheldon Wolin in his idea of inverted totalitarianism in Democracy Incorporated. But in neither case do, do they quite capture what we have before us now. The right has claimed the mantle of freedom since the 1980s. It's done so by combining libertarian and neoliberal and even imperial inflections of the term. Whether attacking affirmative action under the sign of the California Civil Rights Initiative or attacking unions under the sign of right to work initiatives, or waging war in the Middle East under the sign of Operation Iraqi Freedom. If the right also now secures the First Amendment meaning, meaning for dismantling egalitarianism and inclusion, calling it instead repressive political correctness, and if it also acquires the libidinal dimension of freedom for the pleasure of insult, aggression, and general disinhibition of the powerful toward the vulnerable, and if it does this as a new authoritarian statism is under construction, we are in deeper trouble than we knew. We face not just the danger of an authoritarian state power combined with a radically deregulated society where open season has been declared on vulnerable populations. We face not just the way that freedom becomes the cover of this authoritarianism, where restrictions are rapidly being lifted on police conduct, on vigilantism, and on judicial prosecution of hate. We face not just the way that authoritarianism itself is fashioned from the assertion of white male entitlement to take freely whatever it wants, whenever and wherever it pleases, we face not just the way that the seduction of freedom as disinhibition can very successfully recruit the young, the immature, the reckless, and the wounded to this regime. The danger is in all four of these, in building authoritarianism atop a novel culture of freedom. And it's up to us now, I think, to think really hard about what strategies would most successfully counter this formation. No matter who wins the midterm elections, how damaging the Russian ties turn out to be, how badly muddled the Obamacare replacement becomes, our most important and difficult task is not just winning politically over the next several years at the electoral level, though that is absolutely important, What's most important as well, I think, is figuring out how to generate a differently energized populace from the one that brought us to this pass and that is being cultured and cultivated by what I'm suggesting is this new particular fusion of freedom and authoritarianism in the making. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Fascinating talk. So we're going to open it up to questions, and I have one microphone. We'll take a few questions, and then let Wendy respond, and then we'll go to a second round. <coughs> what was, sorry. Hi, um, Hi. Charles Thorpe in sociology. Um, it seems that your uh, explanation of Trump's victory was primarily in terms of race and the, the politics of resentment among white, maybe particularly white working class voters, although you didn't talk much about class. But um, I'm wondering how you square that with, or how you, um, how the uh, data on the election um, fits into your explanation. I mean, according to the Pew Foundation, Trump won white voters by a margin almost identical to that of Mitt Romney. Um, white non-Hispanic voters preferred Trump over Clinton by 21 percentage points, but they preferred Romney by 20 percentage points in 2012. Um, uh, according to CNN, um, 
a slightly, and, and then according to CNN, a slightly larger share of black and Latino voters cast ballots for Trump than supported Mitt Romney in 2012. Um, but there was a big drop in um, African American and Latino voting, um, the low, lower turnout among, among those groups. Um, 88% of African American voters supported Clinton versus 8% for Donald Trump, but in 2012, 93% of the black vote supported Obama versus 7% to Romney. So um, what happened to the black vote for Clinton? Um, then according to um, World Socialist website, um, 20... A reliable source. Okay, well, you know, look, look, look up the figures yourself, but um, 27 million white men voted for Trump, about equal to 27.2 million white men who voted for Mitt Romney, and 43% um, of electri of 43% of um, the eligible voters didn't vote at all for either candidate. So I just I just wonder, you know, how those figures fit with your explanation, which puts everything down to this massive support by. By, by whites, but it doesn't seem, you know, that different from 2012. Thanks. So um, you're absolutely right. If one is looking at percentage of voters, I said early on that these were two of the most disliked candidates in the history of um, presidential elections. I think it's important to acknowledge the extent to which um, withholding votes not just votes for third party candidates, but just not voting at all, was a very important feature of this election, and I think a shocking one to uh, particularly the Democratic Party, not to the... I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Yes, right? Um, that said, what is most surprising was the raw percentage of support among whites as opposed to any other group for Trump, and I am not suggesting that it was um, the white working class. What is most striking is that it's white working and middle class voters, and what I'm also s marking is the extent, to, I mean, I, there's another talk that I didn't offer that has to do with the misogyny and the particular mobilization of misogyny and sexism in relationship to Clinton, but above all, the problem of Clinton being precisely the establishment candidate, the Davos candidate, the Washington candidate, the crony capitalism candidate, the Washington establishment candidate at the moment that American voters were wildly rejecting that from left to right. Now, the actual support for Trump among white voters that I am developing from the statistics I offered early on is a support that identifies with the whiteness that Trump mobilized. And that's why I think it matters. It matters not, I, I'm suggesting, because of class politics. Yes, class politics are there, but Trump's white support comes across the class divide. And his non-white, the, the, the uh, antipathy to him also comes across the class divide. There was a huge racial divide in this particular election. There was less of a huge gender divide among whites. That said, something close to 90% of African American um, women voters voted for Clinton, and another 5% did not vote for Trump. Trump got something like around 5% of the African-American female vote. So the point is not so much where the voters break down, but who voted, who didn't vote, what the racial configuration is, and what they're telling us as they're leaving the polls. And that matters. What they're actually identifying with, why they say, I know he's going to be a terrible president. I know it's going to be a disaster. He might blow everything up. There might even be nuclear war. But he, uh, he speaks something. He speaks to something. He anoints something. He responds to something. And he responds to something really important that we need to deal with. And I'm not suggesting it's simply class. And I don't think we're seeing simply class in any of the emerging xenophobic right-wing parties in Europe 
or in the United States, in Australia. Another question? That's right, you wanted three and then we... That's all right. Yeah. That was a good... That's fine. Hi, I'm a um, prospective grad student from Brazil visiting the open house here at the UCSD. Welcome. Perfect. I hope you come. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to help the department. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for your sure. clarifying talk. It was brilliant for me. But um, uh, I'm curious to know more about your view about an issue that you've mentioned just briefly, which is the argument from the left wing of the Democratic Party that the only way to defeat Trumpism would be to radicalize a discourse in the opposite direction and the premise that Bernie Sanders would have won election if he were the Democratic nominee? Yeah, I don't think we know. You know, I mean, we're all part of these arguments. I, I think uh, it's pretty clear retrospectively that between the loathing of, of Clinton for her gender um, and the loathing of Clinton for her Clintonism, <laughs> for lack of a better term. You know, she had to follow the policies she followed. She had to advocate. She had to make, offer the progress message she offered because she's following in the legacy of both Bill Clinton and Obama. And she had to argue that they had done all the right things and that she was going to continue to do those things. But it's hard to, I think, it will be separating for a long time what was... Uh, antipathy stirred up against her as a powerful, knowledgeable, competent woman who represented what I call the social castration of the class that is already feeling that, and how much of it has to do with the uh, disaffected millennials who feel like their future was robbed from them by neoliberalism, that Clinton represented more of the same. Many of them, as Ivanka will tell you, don't identify left or right. Um, so I think that's unclear. The thing that does have to be figured out is which way the Democratic Party goes. And there's going to be a big battle over that. Um, I think it would be, I disagree with those who say it needs to go back to the center. It, I think it will just lose and lose and lose by going back to the center. Um, but at the same time, I think the question is what kind of move to the left it needs to make. How does it go about continuing to affirm all of the peoples and populations it must continue to affirm? not just because of identity politics, but because they are vulnerable populations. They need to be affirmed, protected. They need to be granted access to jobs, to healthcare, to education, to everything that we offer um, the rich in this country. They need to be part of any democratic campaign uh, platform and, and future. And at the same time, obviously, the language for doing that has to change from specification of identity that continues to sting that white male who continues to understand himself as outside the tent that the Democratic Party represents. So there has to be that rhetorical and discursive shift. But I think more importantly, the question of what kinds of concrete policies especially domestic policies, the Democratic Party needs to represent itself as having in, in the next two and four years is totally up for grabs and totally important to settle. It's not the domain in which I spend my days uh, working, but that's, that's, what we're up, that's what we're in right now. Another question here. Hi. I really enjoyed listening to you. I, I guess I, I'm a political scientist, and so I have, in some ways, a narrow question for you was that many times during your talk you refer to this percentage of public opinion thinks that and this percentage of it thinks something else. Political scientists, I always get nervous about that because that's very different than voters. Yes. And so general statement, you know, three quarters of the voters are in favor of gun control. And guess what? You know we don't have it. Why is that? Because right. that doesn't translate into the way they vote strategically. So the general statements about public opinion are actually, I think, very misleading. Unless one makes comments about what percentage of people who vote think this out of the other thing, generalized statements, I think, are quite distorting. I mean, I try to think of as a way, could I bear that on the content of what you said, and I don't have a particular way, but I think what you said 
is more general about the emotional framing of the appeal and all that is fine, but I would urge a little caution in sustaining your argument by references to generalized statements of public opinion which are not comments about how voting works. I agree and, with and you. A, and, yeah. just a, and a further point yeah. on the way this works in terms of this argumentation is, I think the point he made over there, yes, we can worry about unhappy resentment, which you're talking about, but it is also important to think about what caused the vote to decline in those categories of fact. Remember, we're talking about 70,000 votes in three states. I agree, you absolutely. You know very well the yeah. data that, that Clinton got over two million majority nationwide. So in a way, this whole thing is really wildly off if we're talking about votes. We're talking about the distribution of votes in the Electoral College, and we're talking about why there's a decline of votes in certain portions of the population as much as this question of resentment. So it was a great talk, thank you. So I, uh, first of all, I, I completely agree with you about the, the importance of distinguishing um, voter opinion from general opinion. And sometimes I was identifying one, and sometimes I was identifying another. And you're absolutely right. That said, we also know that different groups voted this time than have voted in the past. So part of what's tricky is, fig is, is figuring out what to do with a, a, a new group of voters. And what we're hoping is that a, a, a whole new group of people are mobilized by Trumpism on the other side to vote next. So it's not easy to do what you're suggesting, and I agree that it has to be done. Question? Yes, back here. I, uh, I kind of have two questions. The first is um, you mentioned the number of people who didn't vote, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are on uh, how uh, the widespread disenfranchisement of minorities through gerrymandering and other uh, methods uh, kept a lot of them away from the polls. And the second is, you mentioned something about, uh, you passed over the, the Russian uh, flag right now. Uh, just as Milo Yiannopoulos was brought down by a young teenager in Australia uh, finding a, an old video of him talking about relationships between young boys and older gay men, and, and uh, it, it seemed to bring him down immediately. I'm wondering how effective you think it would be to link the entire Trump effort, the entire uh, effort to get him in the White House would be with um, the obvious efforts of Russia to destabilize uh, uh, liberal democracies. What was the first half of your question? I forgot. The first thing I do with disenfranchisement, how much... Oh, right, talk? okay. So let's do these um, one at a time. The, um, obviously, uh, we're, there's a lot of hope pinned on the, what initially was simply being seen as a, a, a few little hacking things from the Russian government and now I think appear to be much deeper and wider and more serious and, and more permeating across the cabinet, across his advisors, across his own businesses and so forth. Um, yes, I think, you know, obviously we're all hoping that those investigations actually reveal something so untenable, so unacceptable that even the meek GOP at this point is, I mean, that's really where the, where the question lies, is, is whether it would, and, and, and some members of the GOP obviously are deeply concerned. Well, I was thinking more in terms of popular opinion, just like... Yes. I, I mean, I'm struck as I listen, and I'm sure all of you do the same thing, as you listen to various Trump voters that talk about the Russian thing, it's, it's wild, the, the range of knowledge and ignorance about Russia. I mean, I think probably many of us heard the interview with the... Um, the voters in the South who still support Trump, but a couple of them are made nervous by the Russian thing, and one of them said, they're all communists, you know, it's still communism, it's da, da, da. And then others of them are focused on the Putinism and who Putin is and so forth. I, I think, you know, I, I was saying to some friends earlier, I've made a practice of reading Breitbart every other day. I can't quite do it every day, but I do it every other day. It's not as bad as you think. I, I was shocked by that. It's It's... It's not as bad as you think in the sense that it's all about spin. It's, not, it's, it's about spinning the same story that you read in the Washington Post or the New York Times in just a very different way. But it doesn't have all the, I thought it would actually have the, the ugliness and the thuggery in it. And it, it doesn't very often except in the opinion sections. Um, so uh, I think the question is how the spin goes. Because you know if we had 
uh, uh, media that uh, was a common media, and we and these revelations and investigations, you know, came out a particular way. We could count on a particular result, I think, in in a changed opinion. But if the spin on Breitbart and Fox News and so forth continues to make light of it or diminish, you know, in, 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 short of impeach, impeachment hearings, um, continues to make it a small thing. I, I, I'm not sure how much that will change things. Um, Voter suppression, gerrymandering, um, all of those are important, absolutely important, and equally as important is the question um, that I think many of us asked ourselves, which is why people, well, let's just put it this way. There's also the question of the radically disaffected voter in every racial, regional, and gendered type, the one who just thinks it's either pointless or has been so completely pacified and uh, politically disaffected through what I'm calling neoliberal de-democratization. <laughs> or as we saw, I remember, I think many of you probably saw this story as well, just a few days after the election, interviews with urban blacks who just said, no, I didn't vote. Why would I vote? They're all the same. It's all going to stay the same for us forever. It's a horrible, you know, we know where we are. It's the abjected versus the powerful. And why should I bother doing that? And some of that was generational. Some of it was gendered. Some of it was not. But I think there is also the big question, apart from gerrymandering, which is crucial and now on the agenda, and uh, apart from voter suppression, which is also crucial. You asked me to take several questions at That's once, right. so let's, okay. It's fine. Okay. Um, it's a little bit different. I'm wondering whether there are any data that uh, many of Trump voters would uh, under make America great again. They mean America winning militarily in the world, that they are frustrated that the war in the Middle East uh, did not bring the, what they had expected, so there is some frustration that they got jihadism and not a real win worldwide. Right. So they are looking forward to Trump winning, you know, making a nuclear war would be welcome someplace, and so I'm afraid if there are any data that show that there are such, you know, desires. Down. There probably are. I, I don't I don't know it, but I'm I'm sure there are surveys of voters, um, and maybe somebody here knows this stuff um, and wants to contribute. But I, I I would say this speculatively, and this is really speculative. I think while the bellicosity that Trump expressed about America's power and rights in the world, right up to the point of you know, we should have taken the oil in Iraq, to the victor belongs the spoils, you know, no knowledge of the Geneva Conventions of what's required of an occupying country and all of that. But also, you know, that I, I think the rhetoric was compelling. The reality of his base signing up for a ground war, I think, is, is another matter. Because that's the very base not only that base, but I mean that's part of the base that has um, fought in some of those ground wars, and um, those wars have all been, I'm going to put it really pithily and crudely, uh, discredited, um, lost, but also um, you know nobody wants to justify them anymore. No one wants to take responsibility for them. That's why I think the the bellicosity takes the form of a lot of swaggering about, you know, I'll bomb them, I'll nuke them, I'll nuke ISIS, and so forth. But not a lot of talk about taking hundreds of thousands or more um, soldiers into war on behalf of American interests or on behalf of... So, so I think there's the desire for that kind of imperial swagger at the level of gesture but not a lot of interest in actual war. And I even wonder how far, somebody else might want to comment on this, I even wonder how far the support would go if the swagger materialized as reality. There's a, certainly a desire to, 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 to vanquish the specter of 
terror, but also of American weakness and everything else with might, with disinhibited physical might that I'm suggesting happens at the level of the person and the level of the nation. But support for an actual, yeah. But you mean nuclear or yeah, bombing or 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 a um, yeah or or if it's imaginable, nothing but a drone war, that kind of thing. I think um, I don't know. I think it's a question. I and I um, somebody else may have knowledge about this territory, but I don't. Is there a question here? I have a question. Can you tell me if a person that is very has a lot of powerful authority can become a dictator? Say that in another way, I'm not quite following. Okay, you're talking about being the authorism? Yeah. And I do whatever I want to, but can I become a dictator? The next step? So, I, here's, no, unless, <laughs> unless there is something that occasions the suspension of law and the Constitution. And that's, for, for many of us, why we are so fearful about what the provocation of, of a terror attack, it would have to be something that could be direct, you know, could be on the scale of 9-11, but I don't think it has to be that big, could do to make possible, not necessarily Trump as a dictator, but the suspension of a whole set of constitutional provisions, including elections at a crucial moment if they converged with the timing of a terror attack. And I'm not saying that I think that's likely to happen. I think it's a possibility. I think it's more dangerous with this regime than it has been with any regime we've had up until this moment. So I'm not particularly worried about dictatorship. I'm worried about what happens if this regime gets fortified while it's wobbling and chaotic and disintegrating in various other ways, if it gets fortified all of a sudden by an external shock. That's the worry. I've got a question here. Um, hello, thank you so much for the great talk. I'm a PhD student in bioinformatics, so I apologize if my question is going to be very naive or if it immediately follows from your uh, talk. But my question is uh, about uh, one of the most shocking things for me um, and uh, after the election that the majority of white American women uh, voted for Trump. And I wonder... Not, how not quite a majority. 51-something percent. No, 51 percent voted for Clinton. Of white American female? I white American female. The numbers. Yeah. Okay, but let's say... A, uh, it doesn't a, a matter. A too many portion, white women voted for yes, Trump. A significant yes. portion <laughs> voted for someone who brags about sexual assault. Yes. Um, now, my question is, how do they stand in your classification of Trump supporters to these three strands? And um, it, do you just, you can just, is it, is it just follows that socioeconomical change uh, that they want for their male you, uh, brothers or father or whatever in your family or how, how do you how do you describe so that? a couple of things um i think you know many people in sociology and political science are just starting to work on this to try to figure this out i think it's a burning question for all of us it's not a naive question at all it's a really important question uh, i'll move from the um the sort of sociological to the personal on this not my personal but a person in particular who matters um i think it's important to pay attention to that um, production of authoritarian leanings, the first strain that I mentioned, um, to a person when social science did its, it does its analyses of, of, of authoritarian uh, personalities within a broad population and then tests for support for Trump, they're all there. So fear, anxiety about threats, about foreignness, about instability, about disorder. That's about traditional sexual and social mores, but it's also about precariousness and, and a sense of insecurity financially, but also in every other way, neighborhoods, schools, where your children are, what their future is, and so forth. I think that element really matters in thinking about where um, the possibility of the f white female Trump voter is. Secondly, I think identification with whiteness 
and the, 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 the xenophobia and the racism mobilized by Trump around whiteness had, I, I emphasized a, a certain white maleness at the center of this base um, because it's the largest proportion of his support, but whiteness more generally is also what I'm suggesting matters. So that also helps comprise that. That said, I think we must not underestimate how important Ivanka was in the election. And what do I mean? If a wonderful, intelligent, composed, seemingly kind of non-political, pseudo-feminist, or not pseudo-feminist, but feminist, and, 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 and kind of corporate feminist uh, woman, could argue that all that baloney about her father and the locker room talk and all that wasn't the real dude, wasn't the real man, that what really is there is a loving, generous, kind, good father and husband, <laughs> if, if, and, which is what she did, and what one was looking for was some way back in after his stuff about the pussy grabbing, his, the, the more general, um, you know, sort of <laughs> representation, and, and the insulting, and the denigration, and the, 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 the looming over Clinton in the debate, and so forth. If these women were looking for a way back in, I think Ivanka provided something really crucial, which, which was not just verbal testimony about her father, but not, and not just loyalty, but that articulation of, you know, here's who he really is, don't pay attention to that, etc. Third suggestion that has been made by some of my friends in sociology, and probably some of you have ideas about this too, is that many of these women are living with guys like him and are living and, and don't have high expectations of men and don't really think the world is very different from and don't identify any more with Hillary uh, than, than they do with the man in the moon. And uh, this, that this is the, the, the predicament and the, the, the nature of the sexes, the genders, etc. And that that also, so put all those together and I think it's not that hard to see why you have, and, and in, in, in saying that they're living with guys like this or that they're living at least amidst this world and you know, yes, that is how boys talk in locker rooms, that is what my sons are like, or that is what the guy down the street is like, or that is, you know, m what my world is. That, that, that doesn't mean they love it, but it also means that it isn't, isn't almighty, isn't all decisive, isn't as important as it is for academic feminists or those who are climbing the ladder into the corporate world or, um, or I want to suggest to a lot of African American uh, female voters. We've got time for just two more um, questions. Should we take them together so uh, that I won't, well, yeah. We've got more questions now, but we have to, all right. Let's ask all four. Yeah, uh, let's ask all four and then okay. I'll just do something. <laughs> okay. Because we're inclusive. Yes, we're inclusive. Oh, thanks for a great talk. Thank um, you. I'm really interested in one moment that you described about the impact of the way neoliberalism has become this Frankenstein. Um, particularly, you said something about an impetus for um, the upper echelons of the business class to get involved in politics in the current moment, and I was curious if you could say more about that. Uh, hi, I was just wondering, so with this election, with 538 Nate Silver projecting a conservative prediction that it was an 80% chance of a Hillary victory the day before the election, with the Brexit vote in Britain being a ten, like a 5 to 10% swing in favor of remaining a week before the election, mm -hmm. with the polling data suggesting at the previous British election that it was going to be a tight race on the day of the election as people were leaving the polls, are we seeing something that we're not predicting the way people are voting correctly? Are new groups voting? Or are people less open now about who they're going to vote for and their reasons for voting, as has been in previous votes in you know, Western democracies? Thank you. I found so many parts of your um, your argument so compelling, and then just bringing together so many different strands from a lot of different talks that I've been hearing on immigration, um, looking back to constitutional law. I gave a talk at Michigan a couple weeks ago, and there was a professor, um, Matt Hughley, I think was his name, uh, from UConn, who looked at whiteness, looked a lot at this woundedness, 
looked at the ways in which um, very alt-right groups have a lot in common with also uh, uh, white groups that are very liberal and well-meaning, but that looking at these intersections. So a lot really kind of came together for me in this talk. But one of the things that you know, I kept bugging Matt about at that, uh, that, that talk at Michigan, because we were you know, together for a couple of days every time he was making different arguments, was I guess Trump just, this isn't a very academic question, but to me one of the things that keeps getting me is Trump just doesn't seem so purposeful. He clearly has not read you. <laughs> he clearly has not studied he, these trends. He doesn't read. Right? He doesn't read. So I guess how is it that he, he's able to tap into this so well? And especially mm -hmm. when, you know, Bannon wasn't on his, he was a third yeah. strategist on the campaign. I remember, and I'll just say this last part, I remember uh, when he, at one of the earliest election, or uh, town hall meetings, looking up all their campaigns and everything. He has like four people on his campaign at this time, and yet it has, and he's still such a small staff, and yet they're able to tap into this so well. So, especially for Trump, like, how does he do this? Okay, great. I have to cut us off because I just got the boot from the people that are, there's another meeting here at six, so we have to, I'm going to end the questions and please answer. Oh, okay. Yes. I thought we were just going to end. I don't mean I'm cutting you off. I'm cutting off you. Okay. And remember, we can talk outside as we, as we move on. Okay. So very quickly. Um, the business class in politics is something that has, of course, been developing really ever since the Bushes. It's Reagan too, but especially the Bushes. The move toward more and more of a business class in politics and the, the making of a place for um, the business class uh, is something that began to open in the in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, what I was trying to get at, though, is the extent to which this class is able to move in, not just because business expertise is sought, not just because businessmen are coming to replace lawyers, for better or for worse, as leading politicians, not just because neoliberalism generates uh, an uh, an affirmation of business governance and, and governance practices that come from markets rather than from politics, but also because this class has is, is through neoliberalism actually being forced to seek the advancement of its interests in politics, as it did with the neoliberal revolution in the first place. Because um, neoliberalism is generating a certain uh, Otherwise, st uh, a stagnation that, that requires uh, extraction of rents, which is to say extraction of profit from non-productive economies. So there's a longer story there, but I'm suggesting there's both an economic push and a government pull of this business class into politics. Second, and really briefly, the polls. My department, I'm sure many political science departments, had a meeting right after the election, where did we go wrong? And that's very similar to the departments of economics that had such meetings, of course, in, after 2008, the finance capital meltdown. And it, yet, in my case, it was a fascinating kind of meeting because there was a recognition that not only had political scientists been simply wrong at the level of polling and, and, and survey research, but also had been staring at the wrong things in terms of understanding how this phenomenon could come to be. And here I'm pulling the two last questions together. How could you get this crazy, unstable, know-nothing in power? How did this happen and who put in there and why doesn't political science have very much to say about it? So there's both a question here about voting and polling. And there I think the question is, yes, new groups. No, I'm not sure it's so much that voters are being secretive, but that pollsters don't know the right questions to ask and, and um, don't always know what, what to tap and how and why. Um, yet it's important to remember that um, the defense the five th that Nate Silver, the 538 guy, offered is, look, I was, I, I was within my range. It was just 70,000 votes. It was just, it could have gone this way or that way. Um, I don't think that was very consoling for those of us who were looking at the 538 website every hour for the last two weeks before the thing, saying, okay, we're going to be okay, we're going to be okay. It is important to remember it was a slight loss, but I do think that the world of positivist social science has to come to terms with what the rise of an anti-democratic 
authoritarian, I won't even call it fascist, authoritarian form of power, of political power, is doing to their assumptions about democracy, about voters, about citizens, about positivism. I think the lack of ability to comprehend what certain historical formations, economic pr productions, cultural formations, and so forth have done has really had its effect. Lastly, on Trump and purpose. I didn't mean to say that Trump was so savvy he figured out exactly how to do all of this. That said, he's got an instinct and he knows he has an instinct for for how to rally certain kinds of energies. It's why he loves rallies so much. Sidney Blumenthal wrote a magnificent piece in the London Review of Books on Trump and his rejection by the New York glitterati, the, the moneyed people in New York, how they thought he was crude, the Trump Towers were ugly and awful, he could never get invited to the cool parties, he could never be accepted, he was understood as a mobster, a thug, a real estate magnate who traveled and trafficked with the, with, the, with the mob and the mafia and the New York underclass, which is what you have to do when you're a real estate developer in New York. But he didn't understand why he, he could, and, and, and partly what Blumenthal is arguing is that this is how Trump became so aggrieved. And then finally he found the people in the flyover states, the states he had never been to, who really liked him, who really responded to him, who wanted him. And I do think there is something about that combination of rejection and aggrieved um, status and, and then in turn a kind of channeling and, and, and connection with those who were responsive to it that are not his people. His people were always the plutocrats, but they didn't like him. He became more and more upset and unhappy and victimy by virtue of being rejected by them. And that turned out to just be the perfect recipe for getting all these other aggrieved, unhappy, victimy uh, people um, to cotton to him. So I'm not saying it was all his brilliance, that he read all the right things and learned all the right things. I'm saying in part it's fortuitous, but in part also there is something about his instincts um, that he knows where to go and, and not always, but he knows with whom that connection can be made and, and where it's not working. Okay, that was a weird place to end, but we're ending. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.